voices of praise. They did it again. What do you think? Yes. So, are you feeling good today? Yes. Yeah, it's good to hear about our ministries. It's good to hear about our financial position. It's good to be invited to participate in that and all that is happening here at MCC Richmond. And then we come to the sacred text. I was like, oh Lord, on this Sunday of celebration, we're going to tell people to turn the other cheek. <laughs> right? Because at first glance, I, as I said in my article this week, at first glance at this text, I said, Jesus, you, you have bucked your head. There is no way that we are going to believe this text when we look at this text at first glance. And the reason for that, I think, is because we read this historical text through the lens of a 20th century reality, right? We read this text through what's happening in our own world today. And how could we not, right? It's important that we understand that Jesus is not encouraging doormat theology. Right? Jesus is not saying, oh, when you get abused, love people anyway, let them slap you around, that's okay. Amen. Jesus is not saying that. So let's get that out of the way right away. Right? Jesus is not saying to those who have been abused, to those who have been victims of violence and hate and marginalization and all of that, Jesus is not saying to you, well, just suck it up. Right? Jesus does say, though, love your enemies and do good to them, right? And then if there's any hope of this text that we could save it somehow, it's that line, do unto others what you would have them do to you. Most of us started hearing that when we were in kindergarten, right? When we were learning how to get along with other people, right? Um, and we would want the Bible to just be filled with those verses because they make us feel good. They give us direction that we understand. But here's the deal. If, we, if the Bible was only filled with that message, we'd miss 99% of the other things that Jesus is telling us. We would miss the opportunity to grow <laughs> as human beings. So rather than think of this text as a drag or something that we don't like, I would like to suggest to you, and more than suggest, let me share with you what my study of this text has revealed. I believe that Jesus' words are not ones that encourage us to take pride in being victims or being abused or being marginalized. Instead, I believe that what happened is Jesus continues the Sermon on the Plain that we started talking about last Sunday. That what Jesus is doing is specifically talking to those people in the crowd that had gathered. He is specifically talking to people who have been abused, who have been victims, who are being marginalized by others. And he's helping them to see that there's a different reality for them. Jesus, what Jesus is doing is realizing that in Palestine, in the first century, there were certain cultural things that people would not do. They would not dare risk doing because they would be seen as unclean, right? Remember, Jesus was a conservative Jewish person, right? So the purity laws, the holiness codes of the day were things that people took seriously. Culture meant everything. In that culture, you would not use your left hand for anything other than bathroom needs. Now, you didn't really come to church this morning to hear about bathroom needs, but that's the way it was, right? That was supposed to be a little joke. Uh, you would not use your left hand for anything because it was almost taboo. People would do anything to not have that label put on them. So, it gives a whole different reality to turn the other cheek. If someone slaps you, turn the other cheek and offer another. It's even more significant is you when you realize that the left hand is out of business. You could not use your left hand. So instead, realizing 
that if you were to strike somebody, if you strike them with the, with the uh, outside of your hand, that would mean that you would not see them as your equal, right? You would not see somebody as an equal in that if you would strike them on their face with the outside of your hand. So the only way that you could demean somebody or victimize somebody was to slap, would be to slap them with the palm of your hand. Are you following me? Remember, Jesus is talking to victims. So Kirk, come forward. He is not a victim. But Kirk, come forward because we practiced this last night. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I so enjoyed practicing with Kirk. <laughs> He's embarrassed here. <laughs> but here's the deal. So I want you to grab this visual so you can understand Jesus' words. So Jesus is saying, turn the other cheek. Don't let people get away with marginalizing you or making you the victim. Instead, turn the cheek. So here we go. When somebody would raise their hand, what did Jesus say? Turn the other cheek. That's right, Kirk. <laughs> there's no way that you could slap him. I would never want to, but there's no way you could slap him here and put him down. And the only other way to slap him would be to use the inside of my hand. And that would not be making Kirk a victim. Amen? Yeah. Do you see what I'm saying? Thank you, sweetie. <laughs> so Jesus' words are actually ones of saying, you know what, we can work with the culture here. Let me show you something else. So Jesus is actually empowering people. He is empowering people to resist evil. He's empowering people to stand against the things that would put others down, right? Do you get that? What can we do to resist evil? Well, I just have to have a few more examples, right? <laughs> Later in the text, Jesus goes up again and he says, if somebody asks for your coat, give them your shirt too, right? So the only reason people would ask for your coat back in those days is if you owed a debt, and you have reneged on payment of the debt. Now there were severe rules, severe rules about repaying a debt. So the only reason somebody would ask you for your coat is if you didn't have land or you didn't have money enough to pay back the debt. So then you wipe away the debt with the coat, right? So Jesus says, okay, when they ask for your coat, because they won't continue to work with you on paying back the debt, give them your shirt too. That's only significant in knowing that in the times in which Jesus lived, nudity was forbidden. And the person looking at nudity was the one that was condemned. Now, I know in our day and age, Lord have mercy, all the men in this room would love to see another man without a shirt on. Go ahead and admit it, <laughs> right? But in the days in which Jesus lived, you would not, not want to look at such a thing. So Jesus says, go ahead. Give them, your, give them the coat and give them your shirt. I can just imagine people, no, 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 no. Because if they were to see that vision of nudity, they would be the ones who would be condemned. They would be the ones who would be marginalized by society. So in fact, when we put the Bible into a historical context, we see a radical Jesus who was teaching people, oh no, you don't need to put up with violence. And the reason you don't need to put up with violence is that there's other ways to attack evil. There are non-violent ways to get the point across. And this is what it means to be identified as a child of God, by bringing a different perspective to change evil. And that was what it was all about. That's what Jesus' words were all about. You know, in our day and age, there's a lot of evil going on, right? And there's a lot of reason to find ways to stand up against those systems. I am really big on talking about dismantling systems that choose to marginalize people. Why is that? Because in, when we choose to marginalize anybody, we are choosing to say to those individuals, you do not deserve to experience the love of God. And 
Who are we to judge? Amen. Right? Now, that's a pretty heavy thing to say, right? God calls us to bring liberty to those who suffer. God calls us to bring freedom to those who are in bondage to any kind of illness or sickness. God calls us to be people that liberate one another. And we do that well at this church. But God also calls us to be people who are not afraid. Who are not afraid to say, you cannot treat me this way because I am a human being and I deserve to be treated with respect even when you don't agree with me. Amen? Amen, Amen to that. Come on, church. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we, we tend to put up <coughs> with people putting us down. We tend to put up with the baggage that others bring to our lives and the, the baggage that they use to make us evil or to make us the one who is wrong. When we look at individuals and see within them the love of God in all people, regardless of their behavior, then we truly will be free. No matter how someone treats you, when you can see them as a child of the Holy One and protect yourself in ways that you need to be protected without without displaying violence or hatred for somebody else. My thing is, then you will be free. And that hatred and violence will have no effect on you. When we can see abusers through the, the lens of God's love, then we will be free. I am not suggesting that we need to present ourselves to be continuously abused, because we do not. Instead, what we need to do is stop seeing ourselves as the victims and see ourselves as children of God. We have every right to not be abused. We have every right to live within freedom. We have every right to spread our litter and to be proud of it. Because we are created in the image of the Holy One, and we are called to share that love and that reality with all people, even when it makes us uncomfortable. Right? These words, turn the other cheek, give them your coat, are hard for us to hear because they are calling us to act differently, to be different people, to be people who, instead of throwing others away, are people who believe, who believe that God can break through any hate, any evil, any dysfunction. I also am one who believes that we are responsible for our behavior. And so some behaviors have consequences that people do not like. I am grateful for the justice system that says that if you're going to abuse somebody, the consequence might be that you're going to spend time in jail or you're going to spend time in prison. What's wrong about our justice system is that there's no rehabilitation. But I'm here to say that everyone can be rehabilitated once we claim for them that through the eyes of God's love, they can and will be changed. Right? Sometimes people choose not to be. Martin Luther King, as he led the resistance movement, he realized that he needed to love his enemies and do good to them. That is why, during the Civil Rights Movement, Martin Luther King taught people to kneel in times of oppression. Why did they do that? To, to, to kneel when the, the police dogs were barking at them. To kneel when they were being sprayed by the water from fire hoses. Why is that? That he would do something so bold. He was told over and over again, the only way to combat violence is through violence. And he said, no, that is not true. The only way to change people and to change our society is to teach people about God's love. And so he knelt every time. And you know what happened? Those people who, the, the, the police and those who confronted Martin Luther King and all of his advocates, 
They didn't know what to do because they knew what would happen when people would choose to stay as victims, but when they, when they sought to not be victims anymore, they didn't know how to handle that. They didn't know what to do. I think that God calls us to be people, to stand up and help others not know violence, to know different ways. I served a church in uh, California that the, the senior pastor, on a regular basis, would tell me that I was worthless. Oh, that sermon you preached last week was okay, but it would have been better if you would have done it. And so, you know, after about five years of hearing that, I got sick of it. Right. I got sick of her saying to me, you know, the clothes that you wore to church on Sunday were a little bit off. Now, come on, the outfit doesn't change very much. Right? But this woman had a way of putting me down every single day. I started doing whatever I could to keep her out of the office, right? Whatever it took so that she didn't have to come in and bug me, I would do. And the problem was, I continued to be bound up with hate yeah. and vehemence. And there was a time that I believed all that she said to me. I believed that I was not worthy of God's love and God's grace. And let me tell you what happened. One day she came into the office and started, and I just sat at my desk quietly. I was doing my thing, and I looked up at her, and I said, Do not talk to me that way again. And she was like, uh, yeah. So I said it again. Do not talk to me that way again. And she was outdone, and I was trembling. <laughs> what did I just say? She said, I'm your boss. I'm the senior pastor. You're just the associate. And I said, well, that may be true. But I don't deserve to be talked like this anymore. You will not talk to me this way again. Because I'm a child of God. And she was outdone. The reason I know is she turned around and walked out of my office, and I'm here to say for another year, she never walked in again. <laughs> never walked in again. But I want you to know the freedom that I experienced in that. It was not something that I had planned. It was something that I had to work on my own stuff to be ready for. And then one day, I was just sick and tired of hearing that garbage, and I told her to stop. And she got it. I also am here to say I would eventually leave that church because of that kind of treatment. After I left, all hell broke loose in that church. And she actually had to be removed by the bishop. Now, I'm not here to say I did it because the congregation had to do it. Don't get any ideas. <laughs> The congregation had to do it, but the congregation had to do the work of saying to her, you will no longer abuse us anymore. Because unbeknownst to me, it was happening to other people. Do you see what I'm saying? We can do the work to celebrate who we are created to be. And that is people who know love. That is people who know freedom. That is people to look at the cultural norms and to see what do we need to do to resist evil and to get engaged and do it. And as we do, not only will our lives be changed, this congregation will continue to change and grow. Richmond will change and that's how we'll change the world. By seeing the world not as victim and pers persecutor, those who victimize others, but as people who can celebrate being children of God and to know that there is no better love than to know the love of God because it is that love that transforms people. No other kind of love, not even the love that I have for Kirk Case, can transform you and our community and our world. Amen. So I say, let's get used to standing up and resist everything that we hear about that needs to be changed. Amen? Amen. Amen.